I am now recording as well, so we're going to have everything in duplicate, except that what my Camtasia is doing is it's capturing everything uh, that appears on my tablet screen with synchronised audio, assuming my microphone's working, which it looks like it is. So, so we'll have uh, a record of what appears on that screen to go along with your video of me dancing around, okay. waving my arms around, and <laughs> that way everyone will be happy. Now, um, I've got a certain amount of time today, an hour and a half, uh, but feel free to stop and ask me questions any time in the middle, and uh, I'm sure all sorts of things will come up as we go. But uh, I have already written quite a lot about my experiences, positive and negative, with all this stuff on my blog. So if you want to find out some of the pain I had to go through to get, to, uh, get as far as I've got now, you can have fun reading all about it on my Explaining Maths blog. Um, on the other hand, this page here, which of course is just an ordinary web page, it's not in a big font, but this is my screencast web page, which, which I've got on my blog, um, and the link to it is here. Um, so you just go to my blog and put a slash screencast at the end. It's one of my static pages. And as I, they're called static pages, and of course that means they change all the time. Uh, so um, as I put more of my screencasts on the web that I think might be interesting to people outside the university, I sort of add sele a selection of them to that page. And then uh, I've also added a feedback page where I'm putting feedback I'm getting from the students on my use of screencasts which at the moment is unreasonably positive. Um, more positive than it should be, as, as I will explain, because uh, none of them this year have yet come up with all the perfectly valid disadvantages that presenting by this means actually do, does have. <laughs> the, the, it, it's not all good. So what am I going to try to do today? I'm going to try and give you a demonstration of what I do while telling you about what I do, which is horribly self-referential, which means I'll probably get stuck in an infinite loop and you'll have to rescue me. Uh, but so here you can see I'm using a tablet PC, but I haven't written anything on it yet except for pre-prepared stuff. But what I'm running on this tablet PC is the standard software that comes with it called Windows Journal. It's a bit different from smart board software, so all these different software have got their own quirks and advantages and disadvantages. I quite like some of the things you can do with Windows Journal, like um, push some stuff down if you want a bit of more room or, or move it around or change its colour and things like that. You can, you can do all sorts of fun things, but you don't want to waste all your time doing that. But uh, in fact, the, of the sophisticated tools, the, one I, the ones I use most often are... Um, pushing things around because I need more room, moving them around because I got too near the end of the line. Um, I tend not to use the sophisticated tools available for uh, drawing an approximate circle and then telling it, uh, highlighting that and then telling it to change it into a circle. Because I think that's so they're just um, there just to show how clever it is. Um, but I'd much rather actually have a circle drawing tool, but that's not available in this software. Anyway, that's uh, <laughs> personal personal viewpoint on that. Uh, so, why did I want to use a tablet PC in classes? Well, for one thing, you quite often get a big data projector screen, and then your writing comes out really large, and it's really easy for them to see. Um, I haven't got as big a data projector screen as I'm used to today, but you can see that if you scale that up, um, then as I write on the screen, it's going to come out very large, very easy to read, even if people have got poor eyesight. And so on. That's, a, that's a good start. I can switch colours whenever I want and, and make the colours exciting. Um, I can do all sorts of sophisticated things that I usually don't do. But I do like to change colours just to grab their attention and start writing in red and, and squiggle around things. Uh, so I'll say a bit more about what I do in a moment. Um, actually, I'll, I'll tell you, my, my main system is that I pre-prepare a skeleton of the material I want to talk about in a PDF file with gaps. And so then it says, here's some standard material which I'm not going to be writing today, and here's a gap which I'll be writing and you should fill in while we go. 
But of course, the disadvantage is that I'm going to, at the end of the lecture, save this all and put it all on the web, so they don't really have to write anything if they don't want to. I'm pleased to see, though, that they do like to write things. And uh, this brings on to one of the disadvantages. It's very big, it's on one data projector screen, and there's a limit to what you can show at any one time. So people will say, can you go back to the last slide, please? And of course I can. I can just go backwards and forwards as much as I like. But then the people who were still writing what was on the other screen are in trouble. So limitation to what you can show at any one time is, for me, the major drawback to this system. And there are various, various. What medium would allow you to show all that at the same time? So I'll tell you two things that I know about. Um, one thing I have done, I've used in the past, is um, when you've got dual data projectors, and some of our rooms have got dual data projectors, I would project the unannotated slides on one, and I would annotate the ones on the other, so that at least they can see the statement of the theorem on one screen while I'm proving the theorem on the other. Of course, I have given them as single-sided printed handouts the slides, so they've already got the printed slides already. Um, so, so to some extent, the stuff that's already gone before, when it was on the printed material, they've already got it, and they can just and I can say, well, if you look back at the statement of the theorem, then I can refer to it. But I'd much rather have it showing in front of them with any other annotations I've added at the time. Um, so what can actually do that for them? Um, there is a very expensive system called Thunder, which is um, a digital flip chart, um, which will cost you, set you back about £100,000, I think. And then you get uh, seven digital flip chart uh, screens. And as you start writing on the next one, the others all shift over. And you can have seven screens displaying at a time. And I'd love to have that for my lectures. Yeah. But that, but that, that would definitely help. <laughs> right. I would like to, I would love to work with that system, except that it might be difficult to do the screen casting for that. Yeah, that's right. The big advantage of blackboard or whiteboard, if you've got a big rolling blackboard oh, yeah. or a double rolling thing, you can have about eight blackboards worth showing at one time, or certainly six. And so sometimes, so sometimes there are advantages to the old systems. And uh, that's the one thing I regret, not being able to have more showing at a time. Uh, as I say, it's not all good. Nobody has mentioned that this year. Um, I, got, I got one bit of feedback. They said, on those rare occasions when I didn't manage to get something down in lectures, somebody said, it was very good that I was going to be able to get hold of it after the lecture from the saved version or the screencast or whatever. So, so they've been very positive about it this year. But personally, I would rather, rather I could have more showing at a time. Now, I can change my view <laughs> and have more showing at a time. And if your data projector screen is big enough, then I guess uh, that will do. But it's really going to have to be very, very big to make that work properly. So I don't think I've really got a solution to that. Being able to change scale during lectures can be handy, though, if you want to just squeeze a little bit more on. So technical issues. About time you saw me writing something. So um, what have I mentioned? So there's um, not room for that much on one screen. OK, what about other technical issues in using this tablet? Gosh, that's not come out as blue as it has on my screen. I think we've got a a slight colour issue with this display, which is going to be a bit of a shame. Um, let's see how, let's see whether the red comes out as red. Well, it's reddish. <laughs> okay, so uh, I've got a large variety of colours, um, and I can change colours whenever I want. I can change colours of what I've got. Um, I can. The back button is extremely useful. Or if I've gone back too far, 
and go forward again. One of the most useful tools of this when something goes horribly wrong. Um, the other one being, of course, the fact that you can erase um, nice whole pen strokes. Actually, I think I can use the back of the pen for that. Let's try that. There, so that's the demonstrating the eraser. It's, it's quite good, technically. Uh, so, but what are the technical issues? Well, you're completely dependent on all the equipment you're using, software and hardware, and all sorts of things can go wrong. Now, at the moment, I am using this tablet to do the writing. I've got a wireless microphone feeding what I'm saying in through the mix socket to the laptop sound card. And the laptop is running Camtasia on top of everything, as well as Windows Journal. And Camtasia is doing a screen capture of everything that appears on the screen to make a movie, and recording the sound to give you a synchronized uh, screencast. And the, the room for things to go wrong is absolutely huge. I'll be saying more about some of the things that have gone wrong with the other bits later on. Um, but for the moment, I'm just talking about using the tablet PC without all the screencasting, podcasting stuff. So what you... What's the Windows Journal bit that you've got there? This is Windows Journal here. It's the stuff that works with the pin for digital writing oh, on the screen. The, uh, so this, is the do this document is the Windows Journal note. And um, it's designed to work with the pen and yeah. what they call digital ink. Um, yeah, and... And that's what I'm using at the moment um, to give this bit of the talk with. Yeah, okay, thanks. That's right. So this is Windows Journal, which works with Windows Notes, uh, Windows Journal Notes. Um, and when I'm giving my lectures, I'm working with, as I say, pre-prepared PDF files. Now, I can't write directly on those with Windows Journal, but what I can do is I can print the PDF file to the Windows Journal note printer and that produces the Windows Journal note, which has the PDF as a background. I can't push the PDF stuff around. That sits there as a permanent background, but with gaps in, which I can write in. And I can add extra pages if I need to. I'll show you adding an extra page in a minute. Um, but, uh, so... This is an A4 page portrait. I'm working portrait, um, but showing at page width. That, that, that's, Everybody can choose their own favourite settings. So this is an A4 portrait page, believe it or not, shown at page width. And uh, then the next page starts there. So when I was first started using this tablet, uh, it would tend to crash and not do what I was expecting and give me a lot of trouble. There was a bit of a learning curve. Learning to use Windows Journal, it's got a nice tutorial, it takes about half an hour to learn how to use Windows Journal and do most of the things you want to do with it. And then you get into the lecture room and things start going wrong and you've gone live and you just have to muddle your way through somehow. And then after a few lectures, you actually start to find out how to use the thing properly. And uh, there's a bit of a pain barrier in using all this stuff. Um, but when you get through it, it's okay. It, it affected my pace quite badly at the beginning because not only was I having trouble getting it to do what I wanted, but the software would crash, <coughs> it would freeze. Um, sometimes I had to just quit um, and restart Windows Journal. Sometimes I had to reboot the whole laptop in the middle of the lecture and I'd lose time and so on. And I am pleased to tell you that I found out now what I believe the source to, of almost all my problems was. And I've only discovered it in the last few weeks that if you run the tablet on mains power, it works much, much better than if you run it on battery power. And if you try and do anything challenging with it... Well, it, it, it has to, when it's running a battery, it has to choose, is it going to try and preserve battery power or is it going to try and run as fast as possible? And somewhere hidden in there, I'm told, now I've asked about it, are some settings where you can tell it. But in any case, if, you're, if you need it for two hours on a Tuesday afternoon like I do, um, battery power 
would just cope with that on its lowest usage level. Um, and, and then you've got no hope of getting the processing power. And I was getting the strangest bugs that I couldn't understand, and I couldn't reproduce them in the office, because there, of course, I was running on mains power. <laughs> and eventually, I, I twigged that I was doing something different in lectures than I was doing in the office, and I asked someone. I said, does it make any difference if I'm running on battery power? They said, oh, gosh, we never thought you'd be trying to run it in a lecture on battery power. <laughs> what on earth are you doing that for? <laughs> and that was the problem solved. Most of my problems solved in one fell swoop. If you look at my blog, you'll see that I had five weeks of pain first this year. And I never did realise that in previous years. So I've been, doing, I've been using this tablet for about three years now, yeah? This is a, a Toshiba tablet laptop. Um, I have used others, but this is, yes? I didn't want to keep, uh, I was trying to keep my power cable plugged in in my office and feeding through the usual thing at the back of the desk and so on. And it was a pain to keep taking it out, putting it in my laptop bag, <laughs> coming back. So what I've, I've actually asked them to buy me an extra power cable this year. Uh, they're buying me an extra cable so that I can keep one in place in my office and take one with me to lectures, which will probably save me from forgetting it like I did the other day. I was so disappointed a few days ago when I had to give another lecture on battery power um, because I'd left the power cable in my office, which was very irritating. And all the old bugs came back. And some of the bugs were um, random straight lines being drawn between the last two places I visited on the screen with the tablet pen. I'd have to keep hitting the back button because suddenly there'd be a long diagonal line on the screen. That's OK. I got very used to clicking the back button. <laughs> so, um, so it's all right. You can cope. Um, and occasional crashes and freezes and so on. All a bit of a nuisance. Anyway, so... Technical issues then, we've used the laptop, there were some, most of them are resolved. Most other issues. Resolved by using the tablet on mains power. Give me the mode that turns your handwriting into the best sort of text paper. <laughs> <laughs> well, if it was a if which one? Yeah, which one? The much there, not much room on the screen. Yes, not much on the screen. Well, um, I guess the students have to ask me if they can't read my handwriting. Yeah. But uh, actually, handwriting recognition is quite good, except for maths. Mm, uh, and if it tries to recognise maths, it produces garbage. So I never do convert my handwriting. The students have to get used to my handwriting. Uh, I don't think, it's not the sort of, in, you, it's quite good. I could highlight that and tell it to convert it to writing. But it's going to be such a fuss in the middle of a lecture that there's no way I'm going to do it. No, I'm just going to hope that no, I'm writing on a big screen. On the, on the VLE yeah. or whatever afterwards. Mm, but it's, it's quite, well, okay. No, they will hear me say it as well because mm. they'll, get the, they'll get the screencast if they want it. Also, they'll probably get used to my handwriting after a while. Possibly. I don't, I don't get many comments on, on problems with my handwriting. Very few. OK, so that solves most of the uh, technical issues. Then, as I say, um, what's my methodology at the moment? Actually, it's, it varies. Sometimes I use LaTeX Beamer to produce PDF presentations, but then I back it up with also writing comments separately. So that's one of, one of, one of the things I do. And I'll show you one of those in a minute. Now, Let It Be, but doesn't seem to collaborate very well with being imported into uh, Windows Journal. 
So I tend to swap between the Beamer presentation and a separate Windows journal note for the comments. Hmm? Yes. Uh, well, first of all, the Beamer, the, the you know, the presentations produce several PDF pages per. Uh, the standard way of doing it yeah, is you've got yeah, a, yeah. a. Okay, so then you incorporate that into your Windows journal. It's several pages. You put your annotations on one page, and when you change the next screen, it disappears. That's one problem. And the other problem is it simply, when I exported it back to PDF, it seemed there's a bug. Um, I import it in, I annotate it, I export it back to PDF, and there are spurious black bits and so on. Um, maybe that, you know, I'll try it again from year to year and see whether the issues disappeared. But <coughs> just for the moment, they just aren't collaborating very well. So um, maybe they're separate. A separate document for comments. Uh, right. So then that's, that's one when we're doing it. And then there's uh, or I can use uh, just seminar class or something <laughs> similar. to produce relatively boring slides. Um, unannotated slides, as I call them. Have I spelt that right? Unannotated slides, yes, that's the one. And then uh, with gaps. Then I do import that into Windows Journal and annotate them in Windows Journal. That's LaTeX. It's one of the document classes. PowerPoint and Word. Well, uh, I know from the math side that I'm just thinking the, the broader perspective. Okay, so as a, I mean, you're, you're talking about interfacing with data. Yeah. Well, I mean, mo uh, it's got there's a Windows Journal virtual printer. So if you've got a document that you think you might want to annotate, you can print it to Windows Journal, and it will look fairly close to the way it did in the first place, with. I mean, I, I've hit problems. Exporting PDF and getting it into Windows Journal, it does get a lot more bitmappy. Um, but I found it helped if I went first through Adobe Distiller or Adobe Acrobat Pro to make better PDF files and then go, and then go to Windows Journal. It's a, so it's a bit of a nuisance. Um, sometimes when you import it into Windows Journal, it doesn't look as good as it should. But it's not too bad. And so if you prepared a nice presentation in some other form and you think you want to annotate it using Windows Journal, you just print it using the Windows uh, Journal Note virtual printer um, as one so of your printer uh, options. Sorry, yeah. You said that you prepare the outlines and then you fill in the gaps. Yeah. But there are problems when you're writing the mathematics. So what do you do when you want to write mathematics? No, there aren't any problems writing mathematics. If you've got handwritten right. mathematics and you want the computer to recognise it and turn it into beautiful typefaced ones, that's right. Um, that's right. It can it can uh, it can recognise even my handwriting reasonably well, and it's very clever and it will guess genuine words. It may not be the words I actually wrote, but it will <laughs> guess genuine words. Um, but when it sees mathematical symbols, it just converts them into random. Bits of nonsense that you haven't got a clue. Uh, there is a separate use of software which will convert mathematics into software mathematics. Handwritten mathematics, yeah. okay. And which software would you recommend for that? Uh huh, okay, all right.
Mm. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
and say, I spotted a typo last time. I mean, so they may have already found it when they've checked my online notes. But when I do the recap next time, I normally get a chance to say, here's a, here's a recap. Um, oh, I had a typo here in case you didn't notice. Um, this is what I should have said. But screencasts are fixed in time and never edit them. One can edit screencasts, but I really wouldn't want to get into it. Um, the, the, one, the only time I do it is when I say something that I reckon I really wish I hadn't said. <laughs> <laughs> I won't say it now, because otherwise I'll have said it again. <laughs> you give this module two years in a row? OK, this is my first year doing screencasts, but there's plenty of audio available from past years. So all the past year's materials are available on the web, and I've told them that, and there are clear links to it. And I'm trying to find out to what extent they want to use the past year's materials. Last year, I didn't do audio because I was having to give two lectures in the same, two courses, two modules in the same semester, and I just did not have the time to do audio of everything and sort it all out. Yeah, well, let's say a year one, you've done a, an yeah. acceptable version of what you yeah. What do you do in year two? Do you just simply repeat all this stuff, or...? Okay, I've tried several different things um, with interesting results. In fact, if you look in this case study, you'll see some of the things I've tried. Uh, so what I did with my third year module, and again, as I said, I, I hadn't been, this is my first year on screencasting, but let's, let's talk about the audio version. So I had a complete set of annotated slides and audio from my third year measuring integration module and from my fourth year functional analysis module. And I put them all on the web, and then next year I told the students Let's try something different this year. You've got a complete record of last year's record, rec lectures, which sort of they did, though perhaps not, not as good as screencasts. I said, you look at that material in your own time. I'll tell you what you should look at by when. And when we meet, we'll discuss any problems you've got. And let's have our lectures. Won't be lectures. They'll be tutorials, um, discussion classes. It didn't work very well for the third years. Uh, they, maybe they got behind. Half of them didn't turn up. Um, the ones who did turn up didn't really have any questions. Um, they may or may not have looked through the stuff in advance. So then I said, OK, we'll look at some questions from the question sheets. But then it turned out that the stronger students had uh, already done those questions, so they were wasting their time being there. So then what I found worked better, it took me a little while to settle down on this, was to prepare separate worksheets for each class with some examples to look at based on what they should know. <laughs> and uh, introducing a bit more structure into it helped. And if I'm running it again, then I'll just produce a whole load of worksheets um, and do it that way. But I hesitate to do it because I got rave reviews again. Not completely rave reviews. Some, there were some people with some issues with it. But I got a lot of people saying that they really appreciated the fact that they were being able to learn in their own time. They could rewind me and pause me if I was going too fast, and so on. And, uh, and so I got loads of positive review reviews from the students. But uh, when it actually came to the exam performance, their performances, the third years, were really terrible. 